In the Demon Dimension, Siachi clashes epically with Destra using his dual blades. He initially keeps up with her as they trade blows, but as the battle continues, she begins to easily evade his attacks. While he tries to catch his breath, she mocks him because of his current power level, he charges at her, but she activates her weapon and halts his advance with a powerful air slash. He barely manages to deflect the attack which hits a nearby cliff. However, Siichi is worn out and Destron notices this, so she uses it as an opportunity to end the fight with a swift attack giving no time to counter. He falls to the ground defeated as Destra stands over him, but before she can finish him off Saria comes out of nowhere and knocks her out of the way. The newcomer transforms into a pink gorilla and begins to attack Destra knocking her further back. She easily recovers and fortifies herself, so Saria's attacks do little damage. This creates an opening for her to easily incapacitate the gorilla, Siichi watches on helplessly as Destra imbues her hand with dark magic and lands the final blow on Saria ending her. She transforms back into her human form and Siichi rushes over to see if she's okay, suddenly she turns back into a gorilla and asks him if he thinks she's pretty in that form as she offers her lips to him. This snaps Siichi awake, it becomes apparent that it was all a dream as he is surrounded by his companions in a carriage, they look at him strangely while they worry. He immediately starts to internally analyze the dream and its possible meaning. It is disclosed that Siichi is a high schooler summoned from another world where he was previously bullied for being the exact opposite of a Chad. His classmates who looked down on him were also brought to this world but landed in a different kingdom where they got enrolled into magic school. Meanwhile, Siichi ate the fruit of evolution that gave him a physical transformation and the ability to increase his stats. With this he defeated multiple high-level enemies while leveling up significantly and made comrades along the way. After saving a kingdom from doom with an impressive show of magic, the legendary mage Barnabas invites him to teach at his academy which happens to be the same place his classmates have been summoned to and are learning magic. After a long journey, Barnabas alerts them that they are arriving at his academy, everyone peeps out to see the grand structure and are excited to experience the next part of their journey. They pass through the giant gate and proceed as the headmaster explains that the school gathers students from around the world to learn magic, it is also one of the very few academy cities in the world. The group walk around the market enjoying the sights and smells of the freshly baked goods. Meanwhile, at the academy, the summoned students are feeling marginalized by the native students who treat them like they are a nuisance. They ask Kanazuki, the ringleader of the group, what their next move is going to be, but she springs up to action announcing that she has a feeling that someone they all know will be coming soon, she speculates if it could be Siichi. Her instincts are right because Siichi and his companions have just finished their tour of the city and are now in the principal's office. Barnabas sits them down officially to make the situation clear, it is revealed that students from the other world entered the academy as substitutes for the warriors of the infamous Kaiser Kingdom's empire. Although the students are talented, they don't get along with the native students so constant fights breaks out between the two. Siichi is not surprised by his classmates as they picked on him in the past. If the academy punishes the substitutes for their behavior, they are not sure how the Kaiser Empire would react. Barnabas turns around and suddenly bestows Siichi with the mission to become the savior who will keep the academy in order. He holds his hand up in confusion as it was not part of the deal, but he accepts the challenge nevertheless. The principal hopes that he can train some excellent students to be able to compete with the substitutes. Saria gives him some words of encouragement saying that he is capable of completing the task. Altria wants to know what aliases they would be using to enter the academy, Barnabas has a plan that would spread everyone in the school without arousing suspicion. First of all, Saria and Lilium will begin their studies as students. They pose in their new uniforms and Saria asks Siichi how it looks on them, both he and the principal give their approval as they dance around the office in excitement. The compliment makes her happy to the point that she transforms into her gorilla form which rips her uniform as Siichi complains. Barnabas moves on to Altria, she would pose as a teacher responsible for lecturing the students about adventure since that is her occupation. She is to wear a simple women's suit to complete the look, Barnabas' nose starts gushing profusely when Altria also strikes a pose asking if anyone wants to join her on an adventure. But she knocks him down when she sees his reaction. He next makes Orga Siachi's assistant, and the two guys comment on how cute she looks, Altria launches Barnabas into space with a mechanical push as the others salute him. He quickly returns to the office looking disheveled and orders everyone to follow him for a tour around the school before they leave Siichi reflects on his journey so far, but he's interrupted by Barnabas who decides to take him to the class he'll be in charge of. He warns the new teacher that the students of F class are problem children, as he continues to explain, 
the door suddenly opens and knocks him into a wall. Beatrice stands at the opening and goes to the back of the door to greet the principal. He can't respond because he's now in the 2D world. Barnabas goes back to normal and pleads with her as she scolds him for staying away too long as he wiggles and barks like a dog. The files that he needs to review were piling high and have reached mountain levels. She slams it on the deck and the weight of the thud gets the principal scared. The lady demands to know where he was all that time, but he explains that his absence was for the sake of the academy. Beatrice tests his love of the school by requesting he promptly revises the files for her. He is tasked with reading each document carefully and then sign them. His mind goes to the gutters for a moment, so she punishes him by scattering his work making it more difficult. While the principal complains about what she's done, Beatrice instructs the rest to follow her as they wonder who she is. But Siichi is already intimidated by her assertiveness and follows like a tame dog. As they proceed through the corridor, he wants to ask her a question but he's too much of a beta male to do so, he even flinches when she stops. But Beatrice turns around with a friendly face and apologizes for the display they witnessed. She explains that she was the teacher for class F. The principal has told her to be the assistant class teacher and help Siichi with his work. She points Altria and Lillian to their classrooms which happens to be in the same direction. Lillian is not happy that her class is not close to Siichi since he's her master, but she quickly forgets about that when she's informed that the dining hall is next to her class. The girl's love for food sends her to class without further complaints. Since she's been demoted as the assistant teacher of the class, Siichi is interested to know if she's salty about it. He starts to get nervous when he notices her clutching to her file tighter fearing he's going to meet the same fate as the principal. However, she surprised him by being calm about it and acknowledges that she alone can't unlock the student's full potential. She believes that the students are not problem children, she rather has a positive opinion about them. She sticks to her belief that no matter what others say about them, she knows that they have great talent. Her conviction takes Siichi by surprise, she trusts in the principal's judgment, so she looks forward to seeing him teach them to be good students. He promises to do his best to live up to those expectations. The others comment on their master's kindness and wellness to help. They finally reach the door for class F and he pauses for a moment and wonders if he can be a teacher. Sarian notices his hesitation and encourages him to step inside. As soon as he opens a door a pan falls on his head as Agnos scoffs at his handiwork. Siichi winces in pain before quickly composing himself as he thinks of the kind words Beatrice said about the students. The new teacher calmly makes his way to the front of the class and plants himself before looking up to address them. To his surprise, the class only comprises of four students. One sits there reading a book, the other has his head covered with a giant teddy bear, a diva sits faced away from the front, and Agnos sits there with a baseball bat next to him and with the most cliché bad boy school bully hair cut ever. Upon closer inspection, Siichi realizes that the guy is scowling at him which intimidates him a little, the others just glance in his direction when he makes a sound. The guy is starting to doubt if these children are really good. Agnos slams his bat on the floor which startles his teacher, this prompts the others to stop what they're doing and turn their full attention to Siichi, who now is looking terrified. He braces himself for the worse, and worse comes as they all lean forward into his personal space and begin tormenting him with scary faces. The guy just stands there shaking in fear as the students move like bobbleheads. So much for kind students. Elsewhere in a dark cave, Christ discusses with a wizard through an orb about their plans to resurrect the demon lord, but to do so they need to cultivate the negative emotion of despair from humans. As members of the demon cult, they plan to create this by conquering the Barbador Magic Academy and ending important personnel along the way, they believe that this would help in his resurrection. This would also benefit Christ because he wants to get a promotion to the next level of leadership inside the organization. Their laughs is cut short when a set of magic rings suddenly apprehends Christ causing him to fall to the floor. To his surprise it is Anguria and Demilos who make their appearance. They compare their captured target to grilled pork calling him an eyesore. The two reveal that they will be going to the academy to launch the attack because the mission can't be given to someone as incompetent as him. There will be no need for him to make any preparations as they will finish off everything all at once. The two leave Christ bound as he pleads for them to at least release him, and Guria gets excited at the thought of the students screaming in despair. 
Things continue with Agnos having CHE pinned to the wall and getting into his personal space with the look of an unhinged individual. The new teacher tries to nervously greet him, but the delinquent is not interested in his greetings but just wants to know who he is. CHE is more worried about the lunch that he can smell on his breath because he's so close. Agnos gets more agitated when he notices that CHE is staring at him so he begins to offer him a fight which causes him to start crying as he rethinks taking the class. The delinquent continues to pressure CHE but his attitude completely changes when Beatrice calls his name. She begins to stare him down and a look of dread washes down his face making him turn into a well-mannered student as he rushes over to suck up to her but she hits him with her book and the impact from the blow makes the others hold their heads as if they were the ones struck. He rises almost in tears complaining about the harshness of the attack Beatrice interrupts to alert him that the person he was about to pick a fight with is the new teacher in charge of the class. Agnos is surprised by this revelation, however, he continues to try to disrespect CHE, but the delinquent is met with an Oscar-level slap from Beatrice that sends him spinning like a ballerina into his seat which knocks him unconscious for a moment. Baird scores the slap a perfect 10. Beatrice asks the class to be silent as she officially introduces CHE and informs them that he will be taking over from her and Oligo will be his assistant. Without the fear of being intimidated, he gives his introduction and confesses that he is around the same age as them, but he will still try his best to teach them everything he can in hopes that they can all get along. Oligo also gives her introduction, which is short and sweet. Baird seems to love her cat ears. Beatrice also proceeds to inform the class that Saria will be joining them as their newest member. Agnos is immediately smitten by her and makes it known with love in his eyes. He asks her out on a date but their ex-teacher orders him to be quiet. She instructs the students to make themselves known to Siichi. Agnos goes first but at this point, they are already well acquainted with him. He adds that his fight record is 999 wins with zero losses. With his bootleg Negan bat, he reveals that he has earned the nickname Terrifying Pompadour of Hell. No one is impressed apart from Saria who claps in amazement. She offers to go next and transforms into her gorilla form which just terrifies the students. Siichi and Oliga push her out of the class as they nervously explain that it is just a trick. Brud makes himself known next and reveals that he's a prince of the Kaiser Empire. He proceeds to take shots at Agnos stating that even though they are in the same class, they are not on the same level. The Pompadour Menace gets offended and wants to take the fight outside. The prince is happy to accommodate his request, but Beatrice stops their shenanigans with a well-placed throw of her notebook that lodges into the floor. The two quickly get back to their seats fearing for their lives. Helen goes next and pompously sits there only giving her name, it gets Siichi flushed because he thinks she's kind of cute. Last but not least is the mute Baird Lutra who communicates through the signs that he writes. Meanwhile, in the school corridors, Karen poses holding her head because her senses are telling her that Siichi is at the school. She sniffs and picks up the scent of her target so she proceeds to run in that direction, but she bumps into Sito. They both sit on the floor as she alerts her that she caught a nostalgic smell that made her rush. Sito also gets excited when she said that it belonged to Siichi. They both get happy with the thought that they finally get to see him again. Sito also runs off to look for him. Back in Class F, Beatrice hands them back their last herbalism test. Agnos scored zero because he tried to answer the questions like a macho man stating that all problems should be solved with spirit. Brud scores 90% and is not moved by it as it's expected of him, but Siichi is shocked to see that Baird scored 95% given his appearance. The three boys in the class start an argument about their scores which Beatrice solves with just a slam of her book. With them now in line, she then calls Helen's perfect score, but she doesn't seem too impressed with herself. Saria compliments her from the back in her gorilla form. Siichi and Oliga get her out of the class quickly as the rest look on confused wondering if such a transformation is possible. Meanwhile outside, Siichi pleads with Saria to stop the sudden transformation into the gorilla because the others aren't used to it yet. She too claims to understand, but he is not so sure she does. He leads the way back into the classroom and bumps into Beatrice by accident. She suggests that CHE observe the practical abilities of the four students as a special lesson. He makes sure that she means real combat training to which she confirms. She feels like it would be best for him to understand each student's strength so that he can best guide them moving forward. The new teacher agrees to that point so everyone makes their way to the training area. The four are curious to know exactly who Siichi is so they ask Saria since she's friendly with the teacher. She reveals herself to be Siichi's wife to their shock, they ask about Olida's relation to him, and she discloses that she's his little sister. She goes on to alert them they are not the only three, they also came with Siichi's girlfriend and servant which makes them recoil further in shock.
Agnos runs off crying out of jealousy. Now that they know their relationship, Helen wants to know if he's strong to which she confirms. All the while, the tutors have been summoned by the headmaster to get CHE's first impression of the class F students. He feels that they are more unique than problem children, so he's relieved. Olga also finds them fun to be around. Barnabas informs them that Class F is just a bit different from the other classes. He alerts them the rest of the academy calls them the dropout corps. Beatrice continues to explain that they are all dealing with a major problem. Meanwhile, in the training room, Brud wonders why they are the only ones in there, but Helen prefers it like this, the others stretch in preparation for action. The students intend to show their new teacher what they are made of. They are interrupted when Theobald and his posse also arrive. He begins to throw insults at them stating that they shouldn't even be standing on the same ground as him or even breathing the same air. Brud calls to him revealing that Theobald is his older brother, but he addresses Brud as a fool. He also adds that Brud's class is perfect for a failure like him. Agnos has had enough of the insults and decides to confront him, but Brud tells him to stop. The terrifying pompadour of hell explains that he's not going to stay quiet while being insulted like this. Just as he's about to act, Baird apprehends him from behind as he shouts to be unhanded. Theobald would love to show him the difference between Class S and the dropouts. Helen explains to Saria that Class S is the top class in the academy. The older brother starts to boast about being the next emperor of the Kaiser Empire and dares anyone to challenge him. His attention finally comes to Saria, and he's enchanted by her beauty. He makes his way to her and asks for her name and tells her to rejoice because he wants to make her his woman. She rejects and alerts him that she's already with Siichi. The crown prince can't believe what he's hearing. When he asks again, she doubles down and even confesses her love for Siichi. Theobald is gobsmacked because he can't imagine anyone better than him. He stands there confused as his minions watch on with their mouths wide open. She triples down alerting Theobald that Siichi is way cooler and possibly stronger than him. Agnos laughs at the spectacular way he's just been rejected which gets Theobald angry, but he decides to give Saria one last chance to consider but she puts the final nail in the coffin and rejects him one last time. The crown prince tries to play it cool by leaving and states that he will let them off. He warns Agnos who starts to heckle that he's going to destroy them in the upcoming class competition. Agnos yells at Baird to let go of him since the class S students are leaving, so he drops him to the ground suddenly. Before Theobald completely exits the training room, Siichi enters and just as they walk past each other, Saria calls to him causing the crown prince to glare at him instantly. He stops in his tracks for a moment to get a better look at the man that was described as better than him. With the face of his rival imprinted into his mind, he finally leaves with a smug smile on his face. All the while, Siichi is oblivious to the upcoming danger instigated by Saria. He apologizes to the class for coming later due to the improv meeting set up by the principal. From the look on their faces and the tension in the air, Beatrice suspects something happened so she asks them but they assure her that everything is fine. They are more eager to start the special lesson, so Beatrice leaves the rest of the lesson to Siichi to conduct. He casually alerts them that he will not be using magic, so they don't have to worry. Agnos prepares to announce himself as the first opponent, but Helen interrupts and puts herself first. He tries to complain but she puts him in his place with a glare forcing the terrifying pompadour of hell to back down. Siichi nervously laughs as she comes forward to face him. She feels offended that their new teacher is underestimating them by refusing not to use his magic. But he tries to explain that she's looking at the situation all wrong. She reveals that it is rather them who are assessing his abilities. Helen grabs her dual blade stance and begins to attack Siichi with a combination of kicks and thrusts with her dagger but their new teacher swats them like one with a mosquito. He retaliates with a dual palm air blast that knocks Helen back. Siichi is surprised by her incredible intensity and wonders if she's angry at him. Helen points her blade at him as he asks what he has done to offend her. During that interval, Anguria and Demilos from the demon cult draw closer to the magic academy. They decide to have a wager to see who can dispatch the most students on their raid, but Demilos is sure that it wouldn't be a walk in the park as there are many mages there as well as the principal also known as the Holy Mage Barnabas. This only makes Anguria more excited as she can't wait to fight against the strong opponents so that she can inflict terror and despair on them. They anticipate that the Demon Lord will be delighted with their efforts. Things continue with Helen launching more aggressive attacks at Siichi who complains while dodging. 
All the while, Saria and Olga cheer him, but the other students from class F stand there confident that their girl is going to make their new teacher look like a fool in front of his wife and sister. The intensity of her attack pushes him back as he contemplates using his magic, but he doesn't want to hurt her. Something strange happens to allow her blade to phase through him. Her classmates commend her for her performance so far. She points her blades at CHE advising him to use magic. Agnos cheers that she should finish him off. Helen goes for the finish and dashes towards their teacher like a twister, but she suddenly finds herself up in the air looking at the ceiling. She free falls down screaming but Siichi catches her with a smile on his face before she hits the ground. She looks at him confused because she was sure that her special attack was going to be a direct hit. Helen begins to push him away from her which causes him to grab a handful of balloons that don't belong to him. She punches him in the face which sends him flying as she lands back on her feet. The other students are impressed with the speed he uses to disarm Helen. Meanwhile, Siichi is on the ground with his cheeks swollen and tears running from his eyes. He even has nose bleed whilst his people call to him worried. Agon laughs at him while he's in that state and steps up to be his next opponent. Brud asks him to hold on and suggests that the remaining three of them should fight their teacher at the same time. The terrifying Pompadour of Hell is a little annoyed by that idea, but Siichi alerts them that he doesn't mind. Brud pleads for him to give them some time as the three huddle up to formulate a plan. The young teacher watches on as they argue among themselves. From the looks of things, he doesn't believe they get along very well and wonders if they can fight as a group. The bickering comes to an end as they step forward ready to engage him. Agon promises to avenge Helen for that accidental grab as he gets into his personal space. Siichi pushes him away and realizes that the other two have surrounded him. Agon attacks first with his bat that looks like a dirty cotton bud which he swings wildly, but the rookie teacher easily dodges. Before he can fully evade, Baird comes in hot with a powerful punch forcing Siichi to summon his swords to block. The three carry on their relentless attacks and charge at the same time. Siichi manages to hold the first two attacks with his hands and stops Brud's blade with his teeth. With all three nearby, he jumps up in the air and creates a magic launch pad. He then drives down with an attack as the students watch on helplessly. The impact of the blow creates a giant shockwave that shakes the whole building. Even the principal feels it from his office and wonders what's going on. The aftermath of the attack is visible as the three lay knocked out. Saria and Olga rush over to Siichi to congratulate him on his win. Their celebrations are cut short when Agon starts wailing and punching the ground frustrated. As the tears flow from his face he comments on how they will continue to be labeled as laggards if they are unable to use magic. He believes that if they had the ability to use magic, things wouldn't be as they are now and perhaps they would have won this fight. His emotional words resonates with his classmates as they too start to get teary. Siichi uses his world eye skill and he is surprised to see some invisible chains wrapped around the students of class F. The system detects it as a magic resistant reaction. It explains that it is when an individual can't use magic for a certain reason. He looks over to Beatrice as it confirms what she told him earlier about them. They have become an object of ridicule among the students who have magic. He thinks about how hopeless they must feel about the future and how difficult and painful it is for them to attend a school that specializes in magic and not being able to use it. The thought of it all makes him cry because he too was picked on in school when he was in his world but he was saved by the people he met when he came to this one. He wants to do the same for the students, Siichi wipes his face and alerts them that he's going to help. Agon lets him know that it's impossible, but the rookie teacher is sure he can prove that the students of class F can use magic. Beatrice looks at him with hope as he begins the process to break the chains caused by the magic resistant reaction, which would unlock their hidden power. The students line up and watch on apprehensively to see if it's going to work, the system activates the skill that will enable him to perform the feat, but it kind of throws digs at him for using the easy way out. The power starts to well up inside of them as they feel a hot sensation from within. It reaches the max allowing them to break the chains. Helen showcases her abilities first by activating her firepower with a little display. She is mesmerized by her ability and so is Agon as he gives her hype. Next. Baird charges up his fists which causes a shock wave before he hits the ground which makes boulders to jet from the floor, indicating that he has earth-based magic. Brud thinks he too can use magic and so does the bear head who encourages him to try it while informing him that his element is water. The prince begins to sing and dance before activating his magic. It seems like nothing happens for a moment before some water gushes down all over him as everyone looks unconfused. When the shower ends, he gets excited that he can use magic, seeing everyone try, Agon also gives it a shot, but before he starts, 
Baird informs him that he too has an affinity to fire magic. Agon wonders how Baird knows this, so he lifts his finger and generates some fire which gets him hyped, but he forgets about his pompadour and sets his hair ablaze, Siichi panics a little and points it out to him, Beatrice stands in the background also worried. Meanwhile, Saria and Oliga watch on excited by all the wonderful things happening, Agon is too busy taking in the compliments to tend to his burning hair. He only realizes when his teacher points it out to him again, the tough guy runs up and down screaming about how hot it is. Brud helps him out by casting his water spell which instantly extinguishes the fire, but it leaves him super wet. Helen begins to laugh at their antics which astonishes everyone because she is so standoffish normally. They all join her as they cry tears of joy and jump in celebration because they are now able to use magic. Beatrice watches them as they happily discuss this turn of events, she thinks she must be dreaming. Agon's attitude completely changes towards Siichi as he rushes over to ask if he could call him brother from now on. The rookie teacher just alerts them that all he did was unlock their hidden power. They all thank him and start to address him with the respect he deserves. Brud speaks on behalf of his classmates saying that they will practice more and try to master their magic. Agon is just happy that they will never let them call F-Class laggards. Saria is happy for her husband as he has cemented himself as a teacher. He gets a bit shy of the appreciation he's getting as he pleads with the delinquent to stop calling him brother. All the while, Altria sits at one of the school's outside spaces and complains about the workload of the teachers. She has read so much that she's starting to feel drowsy. Karen also from the other world emerges out of nowhere and begins to sniff her, this creeps her out. Ever since Siichi arrived at the school, she has been looking for him and is now tracking him down by his smell. Because Altria has been with Siichi, his smell is on her. Karen's nose detective work becomes too much so she pushes her off and runs away. Elsewhere, Saria hits the town and enjoys her favorite dumpling and likes it so much that when she talks, light comes out of her mouth. Karen's nose has led her to Saria and she begins to sniff her too, this annoys her a little, but she carries on eating her food. Karen gets upset when she smells his scent all over her too, at this point Saria has had enough and wants to know who she is. Later on, everyone gathers for food at the dining hall, there is an array of mouth-watering foods available for them to select from as they all mingle with each other. Karen walks by and sees the back of Siichi's head which makes her pause, she calls his name, and he turns around. The rookie teacher is surprised to see her while Saria and Altria recognize her and complain about her excessive sniffing. The two lock eyes for a moment before she runs over to hug him. Everyone else is more confused that they know each other. All the while, Anguria and Demilos from the demon cult have finally arrived at the school and proceed forward stopping just before the gate. They notice that there is a magic barrier that surrounds the whole school. Anguria shoots a spell at the barrier to test it out but it catches the attention of the guards. They rush over to find out what she's doing. She politely asks the guards to open the door for them as they have something important to do. The guard wants his question answered and starts to scold them, but Anajaria casts a spell that shuts him up and also allows her to control the guard. She asks him to open the gate for them as a white mask appears on his face. He turns to do what he's been told. The other guard shouts to his colleague trying to find out what he's doing, but it's too late as she casts the same spell on him. Demilo's comments on how you her ability is, the corrupted guards open the doors for them to walk into the school without any opposition. Meanwhile, everyone inside is oblivious to the danger that just entered, the two laugh as the giant door closes behind them. Karen knocks a shocked Siichi to the floor and embraces him like he's her long-lost lover. The other students watch stunned at the show of public affection, Siichi's main party stands there looking at how things will unfold but Altria is not so calm about this whole situation as the color has left her body seeing her man getting handled like that. Karen comments that although his appearance has changed, his scent is still unmistakable. Altria's shock has now turned into blazing anger as she asks Siichi to explain the situation when he already has her and Saria as his love interests. He tries to justify but she doesn't give him the chance and starts attacking him for being unfaithful, but he promises that it's a misunderstanding. The beatdown only comes to an end when Beatrice comes to intervene shouting for her to stop, but by this point, Siichi looks like he's been beaten by Mayweather and Mike Tyson for trying to protect his girlfriend's honor. Karen is just happy that he's fine even though he looks bruised all over. Beatrice begins to berate Altria for fighting on school grounds because it's against the rules and warns her not to do that again. All the while, Karen expresses her joy again that she managed to find him. She suddenly begins sniffing him and notices that he has other scents on his body. She confronts the ladies as to why they have his scent on them. Karen demands an explanation regarding this whole situation or else she will act. 
The girls transport themselves into a Dragon Ball Z-like location when they power up like Syrians as they battle to see who has the closest relationship with Siichi. Karen reveals that she grew up with the main man and they were childhood friends. The others also state their relation to him, but Saria wins when it's revealed that she's his most powerful partner, her attack proves too strong and knocks Karen out. They find themselves back in the school cafeteria as she lies there defeated, Siichi rushes over to check to see if she's okay. Karen is just happy to be held by him, she suggests that she should be taken to the infirmary. After she's treated, they all sit around the table for a more civilized discussion. Saria wants to know if she too loves Siichi, she blushes as she lets her know they are only friends. Altria comments that there was no need for them to fight then. They all agree that they like Siichi in their unique ways, hearing them say these things makes Karen jealous a little, but she cools off suddenly and alerts them that she was once helped by Siichi. She used to get bullied when there were children because she looked tough and arrogant, one day some boys took her back. Siichi stood up for her but the bully's attention was turned toward him as they beat him up as Karen watched on helplessly. After his beating, the two sit on the swings as she thanks him for the help and wonders why he did it. Young Siichi alerts her that his parents raised him to always help those in need and he also lets her know that she looks just fine the way she is, which made her happy. Later on, she heard that during that period, Siichi lost his parents in an accident which surprised her because he still managed to keep a smile on his face. But during their high school years, the tables had turned and it was him that was rather getting picked on. Many things had happened to him, but she couldn't give him any help. She couldn't even call out to him because guilt had taken over her mind. Back to the present, Siichi apologizes to his party and reveals that he and Karen come from another world. He states that he's not as good as they think he is as he transforms into his natural appearance. They all gasp in shock to see a short stubby guy, he is unable to give eye contact out of embarrassment. Siichi takes them out to one of the school's courtyards to continue the revelation. He describes himself as fat, short, and ugly, he puts the icing on everything by adding that he has a bad smell. His improved appearance was because he ate the fruit of evolution, Altria pleads with him to slow down because they are struggling to process the constant bombshells that he's dropping. Karen starts feeling guilty watching his confession and apologizes to Siichi for having a slippery tongue. He doesn't think of it as a big deal because he would have had to reveal it sooner or later. The version of himself they have been seeing is not his true self, he apologizes again for keeping it from them for so long. Saria asks him to look at her and lets him know that his core is still the same regardless of how he looks. She proves this by transforming into her King Kong form stating that although her appearance has changed, she is still Saria. So she likes him because of who he is and not because of his appearance. Altria also brings up the point that she was known as the Scourge, but he still took her in. Origa also chimes in stating that she was an assassin with so much blood on her hands, but Siichi saw past that and held her hand, so she can't turn her back on him. Their kind words moves into tears. Lillian also alerts him that she too is not bothered by the revelation. This proves that they all care about him, so he should believe in himself. He thanks everyone for the kind words. Karen watches on and admires the beauty of their relationship. She feels like she doesn't need to worry about Siichi again since he has such good people around him. He sees her as part of their group now but she thinks that it would be better if they no longer have any relationship. This confuses him and he asks why. She explains that they were sent to the school by the Kaiser Empire. They are in a situation where they can be attacked at any time, so she doesn't want him to get involved. If some of the students from their world were to find out about his identity and spread rumors, he could become a target too. Even though Siichi is now strong, she doesn't want to get him into a violent world, she walks up to let him know that this time it is her turn to protect him. She's happy to see that he is doing well in this world. As she turns around to say goodbye to him, Orga notices her bracelet and she gets an instant flashback to when she was forced to work for an evil king. She immediately clutches onto Siichi in fear, and he notices and asks her what's wrong. She points to Karen's bracelet while being in a distressed state. He instantly recognizes it too and quickly rushes over to Karen to find out where she got it from. She reveals that all the students from their world that landed at the Kaiser Empire got given it on arrival. They were told that it would boost their powers, Siichi uses his detection skill to look at the bracelet closely and it is as he feared. It's a bracelet of affiliation, the anger starts to well up inside of him which reacts with the fruit of evolution also within him. This releases a dark aura around him as he's sent into an inner world where his shadow projects forward but there is a one-eyed entity within it. The creature manifests and stands before him and moves closer with its eye open. A bright red light emanates from it causing marks to appear on Siichi's face. His eyes also turn red. He lets out a powerful scream that gets to the girl's head. 
The pressure from the scream breaks the bracelet as Karen collapses to the floor. The shouting continues and so does the sinister aura as they call to him. The shockwaves pulsate through the school knocking all the students that came from the other world out. Their bracelets also break and the students from Class F's training comes to a halt as they hold their heads in pain wondering what's going on. Headmaster Barnabas stops what he's doing and immediately recognizes what this all means as he comments that something has come at last. Anglia and Timiolo's pre-attack coffee break is interrupted when they sense the power. The wave spreads across the whole world as the major players pick up on it. Back in the internal world, Siichi stands there as the sinister shadow grows some teeth in preparation to devour him. Sirius' call snaps him out of that state allowing him to step back before he is eaten. In the real world, he falls back as he regains consciousness, his party rush over to him to ask if he's okay as they all hug him. He apologizes for making them worry before rushing over to check on Karen, she alerts him that although she lost consciousness, she feels very good now. The party finally reveals to her that students wearing bracelets were all being controlled by the Kaiser Empire. Siichi is just happy that the bracelet hadn't been given any orders yet. Karen wonders why they would have such a bracelet that does that, the principal comes to alert them that the Windbelgian and Magic Kingdoms wish to ally. This concerns the Kaiser Empire which has plans to conquer the world, so they want to stop the formation of the Alliance. He suspects they want to control the warriors to destroy either one or both kingdoms. He comments on how very good it is that the students' bracelets have been destroyed, so he proceeds to thank Siichi who awkwardly responds. As the principal leaves, he warns them not to tell any of the other students. Karen begins to get worried about what the headmaster just revealed, but Siichi assures her that he will protect her no matter what happens. The group make their way back inside to have dinner. Karen calls Siichi and expresses her desire to join his team as his big sister, but the guy is a little reluctant about her taking that role. Another student from their world called Sito hides behind a wall and overheard everything that was disclosed. She is friendly to Siichi, so she is just happy that they found him. During that interval, Anglia and Timiolos discuss the big surge in power they just sensed, the two are interrupted when Alio, the wizard for the Kaiser Empire communicates through their coffee. They find it gross, but he dismisses their complaints to alert them that the bracelets of affiliation have been destroyed. The wizard is a little angry that they are nonchalant about it because they put a lot of resources into training the students so that they could help during the attack on the school. The extra negative emotions created by them could have aided them to resurrect the demon lord faster. But the two are not worried. They alert Alio that they plan to launch their attack after they finish their delayed lunch. This only makes the wizard angrier, but he forgets about their antics to discuss the surge. He reveals that whatever it was, the Demon Lord's dark energy has increased because of it, he is confident that the Demon Lord will be reborn soon. He begins to waffle on, so Timiolos disconnects him by vigorously stirring the coffee. He goes to carry on drinking it, but notices that it now has a foul taste. All the while, in another dimension, a giant eye appears in the sky as lightning strikes. Siichi wraps up the day's teaching with a few announcements, he alerts the students that the class fight will begin the following week. Agnos is so eager to get in there and makes it known that he's ready to fight right now. Since unlocking their powers, they have been working so hard with one goal in mind, the terrifying Pompadour of Hell starts to get agitated when he thinks about how Theobald and his crew from Class S look down on them. He stands and loudly professes his desire to beat the arrogant elitist in their next matchup. Siichi tries to bring him down a few notches by informing him to calm down. Brud pipes up and pleads with the young tutor to give them more training after school. He understands their enthusiasm now that they can all use magic, but he advises them not to overstrain themselves. Helen also feels the same as Agnos and is determined not to lose to their bullies. Siichi notices her shaking with anger like a faulty washing machine at the thought of Theobald. Beatrice asks Siichi to see if he has changed his mind. He caves in and agrees to the extra lesson after feeling the energy in the room. Meanwhile, in town Anglia and Temiolos are still lax about beginning their assault on the school as they eat dessert at their new favorite restaurant. They try to justify their inactivity stating that they can't fight on an empty stomach. Anglia requests the bill, but Temiolos interrupts and rather places an order for more food. Back at the school, Class F has moved to the combat training area where they face Siichi ready to fight. Baird starts the assault when he punches the floor with his earth magic, the energy travels along the ground and erupts holding their tutor in place. The other three follow up with simultaneous ranged fire and ice attacks that jet towards Siichi, he prepares to cast a defensive spell, 
but something blocks his attempt causing him to become pixelated for a moment. He's forced to block using other means but still takes their attacks with ease. The student gets a bit deflated that they can't defeat him. As they complain among themselves, Siichi looks at his hand confused about what just happened. He remembers the same thing happening when he faced Helen in a similar situation. His attention is brought back to the class when Beatrice comments on the rapid progress the students are making. The young teacher seconds her statement and alerts them that if they keep working hard, they will one day defeat Class S. Agnos tries to hide his happiness with their words of encouragement, but it's obvious to everyone as they all laugh at him. The class's happy moment is interrupted by Theobald and his minions. They begin their usual insults and even throw some shade at Siichi. Class F dismisses their slurs and Agnos just takes it as them spying on them out of fear of losing. The Crown Prince tells them how little he cares about them, explaining that he's just there for training, and makes a few more disrespectful comments. This gets Helen irate who quickly removes her blades ready to attack him, Theobald notices that she's from the Balsha Empire based on her daggers and makes a political comment about how his family's empire will rule over her weak country one day. His utterance takes her over the edge as she lunges to attack him, but the bare head holds her back. Brud steps up to confront his older brother about his statements informing him that it's impossible to rule a nation only by force. He lets him know that Siichi hasn't given up on him, and the mention of his name rings a bell because he was the one that Saria pointed out as her lover when rejecting his advances. The crown prince is interested in fighting Siichi to see if he is more powerful than him, but the teacher is more confused about the situation. Brud blocks his brother notifying him that Class F is his opponent and not their teacher, he promises to show his resolve in the upcoming fight. Theobald finds this amusing and decides to leave with his minions. Helen pleads for Siichi to make them stronger as she calls him her teacher for the first time. Everyone is shocked by this and she's a little embarrassed, but he assures her that he will try his best to bring them up to standard. Over the coming days, Siichi puts them through some rigorous training by combining condition exercises with martial arts drills among other unorthodox methods. Their boot camp comes to an end the day before their class fight, that night they take a relaxing bath to aid in their recovery. Baird enters interrupting the other two's conversation and Agnos is surprised that he still wears his bare head in the bath. Brud reveals the rumors going around that he's hiding a handsome face under the headgear. This surprises Agnos because he thought that he looked like a bear under the bare head. Their conversation comes to an end when their teacher joins them. Meanwhile, in the girl's bath, Helen has a heart-to-heart -heart with Beatrice as she scrubs her back. The following day, Anglia and Timiolos are still in town and seem to have forgotten their reason for infiltrating the school grounds because they are now in a clothes store trying pieces on and having a little shopping spree. Timiolos complains that she's buying too many items and suddenly their fun trip is interrupted when Destra appears before them. Their smiles turn to dread as she asks their opinion of which dessert is best to eat. They ask the reason for her presence but she ignores the question and makes her way to Temiolos with her hand emanating dark magic. She places it over him as she reminds them it's time to work and warns them of the fatal consequences if they are consistently wasting time. The duo receive the message loud and clear, so she cheerfully bids them farewell before disappearing. The two quickly prepare to make their move. During that interval, the students at the academy gather in the Colosseum-style area cheering in excitement for the class fights. The teachers sit there a little more reserved waiting for the event to start. Principal Barnabas stands in the center of the fighting area and officially opens the event. The ceiling of the auditorium disappears revealing the clear skies as fireworks a shot to commemorate the opening. The first match is between the S and F class. Both members line up as the principal explains the rules of engagement. The team loses the match if all the members are defeated. No matter the outcome of the battle, students are not allowed to fight after the match. As Beatrice listens, she notices Siichi's absence and worries about his whereabouts. Turns out the guy has an upset stomach. He tries to leave the toilet but his stomach growls and sends him right back. Lillian gave him some dodgy food the previous day. Saria and Oliga wait outside the toilet telling him that the match is about to begin. Meanwhile the principal orders the first combatants to step forward. Theobald arrogantly comes out and states that he can defeat the whole class alone. His younger brother steps forward as his opponent. Agnos checks up on Brud and tries to downplay his worry for his classmate. Just as the principal signals for them to begin, some magic rings suddenly come flying and apprehend the old-timer, but he rather feels comfortable while getting squeezed. 
Agnos calls him a freak when he notices that he's not bothered by the high tension the rings are putting on his body. His complaints are interrupted when a giant magical seal appears above the open ceiling and shoots a light down at the fighting area. Anglia and Timiolos arrive when the light disappears. They introduce themselves as apostles from the demon cult. Their affiliation catches the attention of Barnabas. Shortly after, the exposed sky turns red as an evil eye appears, this causes the students to start panicking. Timiolos orders them to be quiet as Anglia frankly alerts them that they are all about to meet their maker. The intruders continue to explain that everyone will be used as offerings for the demon lord. Before they can react, Timiolos erects a light barrier trapping the students in their sections. Some pupils try to destroy the barrier by firing their magic but it absorbs their attacks and fires it back at them evaporating the students. Seeing this only makes the others spiral into despair as they scream for help. Beatrice attempts to calm them down as the intruders stand there admiring their handiwork. They plan to drive out as much despair from their victims before they end them. Theobald and his minions confront their attackers since they in class F are the only ones able to engage them. The crown prince confidently fires a lightning spell at the intruders, but Anglia easily deflects the attack with one finger and sends it back to him which nearly hit the students. They look away for an instant and the cult members disappear from their sight. Anglia gives up her location when she emerges behind them and with one touch she turns the crown prince's minions into her own. This is indicated by the white masks they all now wear. She orders her new servants to attack Theobald which they do simultaneously. He blocks their assault as he asks them what they are doing. At this point Timiolos casually stands out of the area and explains that his partner can control anyone she touches at will. Theobald gets overwhelmed by the constant attacks and just as they come down to finish him, Brud calls out before tackling his brother out of the way. The crown prince immediately berates him for interfering and tells his brother that he doesn't need his help. Anglia overhears their brotherly fight and is happy to see how long they can last against her. When Theobald reveals their lineage, she just hopes that she can end them both so that their nation's people will grieve at the loss. She orders her boys to attack but Agno stops them with a fire spell knocking them unconscious which releases them from Anglia's hold. Class F rush over to make sure that the brothers are alright. Brud suggests to Theobald that they should work together since their opponents are very powerful for the sake of the academy, they must join forces. He knows that Helen will be against this arrangement, but he pleads with her to think about their current situation. She reluctantly agrees and the two boys are okay with it, but Agno states that their match will continue when they have dealt with the threat. The five of them charge at Anglia at once, she quickly blasts F-Class away and blocks Theobald's attack with her umbrella. The half-masked woman quickly counters and stabs him with the tip of her accessory. She thinks her attack hit as she reveals that the crown prince used Class F as bait so that he could land his attack. She is surprised to see that he is still alive because he cast a defensive spell just before he charged in. He snatches away her umbrella as he retreats. Brud signals Baird to attack with his earth spell which holds Anglia in place leaving her open to the other three's direct attack. The damage cracks her mask which allows her alter ego to come out. The students stand there shocked as her scarred face alerts them of their death now that they have seen her true form. She shoots some powerful fire magic that none of them can defend against. Timiolos watches on amused as he explains that the mask covers her face and the real power which is hidden deep in her heart. She gained the ability to produce this intense fire after her face was burned. The flames are the hellfire that bears grudges against everything. She makes her way over to Helen and comments on her beauty before confessing that when she sees attractive female faces, she gets the urge to destroy them. As she prepares to burn her face, Beatrice hurls her folder through the barrier and hits Anglia's hand, canceling her attack. The teaching assistant informs the intruders that they are not allowed to attack her student. The story reopens with the continuation of the demon cult's attack with Class F's assistant teacher Beatrice who steps forward as her students lay there unconscious after being dealt with by Anglia. Helen comes back to her senses and calls her teacher who confronts a confident Anglia. The infiltrator mocks Beatrice for her verbal warning and is interested to see if she can back it up with action. All the while, Principal Barnabas gives an overdramatic apology for not coming to help his staff and students because Temiolos has restricted his movement with bonding magic. However, the old-timer seems to be comfortable in his current condition. Back on the main stage, Beatrice releases her power for a moment which gets Anglia a bit shook, so she makes her way over to Agnos and casts a spell on him causing him to jolt awake and scream in agony, but his cry abruptly stops with the completion of the spell. He stands up with a white mask on his face, Anglia laughs in a sinister manner as she reveals that he's under her control. The other students from class F regain consciousness wondering where their main teacher is, unbeknownst to them the guy is in the toilet with an upset stomach. Anglia orders her puppet to attack 
Without hesitation, he rushes his teacher throwing punches at her. She dodges as she calls for him to stop and return to his senses, but the guy is rather increasing the intensity of his attacks. Brud shouts for his classmate to cease, but he still doesn't listen. Anglia interrupts to tell him that he will only listen to her instructions. She demonstrates this by commanding Agnos to tell Beatrice how he truly feels about her. He gets in her face and discloses that she didn't do anything for them, and it was because of CHE that they were able to use magic. This cuts deep for the teacher as she stands there shocked by his comments. She squeezes her face in anguish, and with a deranged look, Anglia remarks on how she loves the optics of the whole situation. Agnos continues his physical assault as his teacher blocks with her magic notepad. The others plead with Beatrice to overlook his words explaining that he has been compelled to say what he said, and just like them, he is grateful for all she has done. Brud leads the other three as they march to stop their classmate by force, Beatrice shouts at them not to approach. She sees this as a punishment for not being able to bring out their talents. The possessed student finally breaks through her guard and lands a punch that knocks his teacher down. Anglia gets excited and orders him to finish her off, but Beatrice taps him across the head with the notepad in an endearing way and informs him that she still wants to be his teacher. He wakes up from his slumber under the mask as she tells him to get a hold of himself. Anglia notices a change in his demeanor as she asks him to rip his teacher apart, but he doesn't move. Brud figures that the tap on the head acted as a cue to remind him of their teacher's strict yet warm affection. The visions of those moments brings about a malfunction with the spell which leads Agnos to shout in pain. His mask suddenly breaks which knocks him unconscious, but his classmates are there to hold him. Anglia screams in shock that the spell was broken. She turns to the assistant teacher when she closes the distance. Beatrice scolds her for using others to commit evil deeds and suggests that she needs strict discipline. The intruder gets annoyed by that statement and shoots an intense flame at Beatrice, but she extinguishes it with one swipe from her notepad. Anglia recoils in fear when threatened, the teacher activates a spell in which she comes down like a meteorite while writing her book. The intruder doesn't get a chance to counter as Beatrice crashes into her. She cries in agony while landing headfirst on the ground putting an end to the lesson. The other students cheer as the victory is theirs. Their loud applause wakes Agnos up. Beatrice calls to him with a smile on her face. He cries and feels compelled to apologize to his teacher even though he has no recollection of what exactly he said. He only lets her know that whatever he said wasn't true. She responds with a tap on his pompadour and jokingly informs him not to fall asleep during class. Class F joins together to thank Beatrice for saving them and comments on how strong she is. Agnos is surprised to hear this. They alert him of some of the things he did while under the enemy's control. As they laugh it off, Timiolo steps forward reminding them that he's still around. They don't hear him initially as the class is too busy interacting with each other. This only annoys him, so he gets their attention by raising the principal high up and attacking him for all to hear. His fake scream of pain shuts them all up. This gives Temiolos another chance to reintroduce himself. He advises them to save the celebrations until they defeat him. The others comment on how they completely forgot about him. This only angers the guy further, so he repeatedly attacks the principal. Beatrice puts an end to it with a throw of her powerful notepad causing Barnabas to fall to the ground still bound. Timiolos is comfortable taking on the teaching assistant as he asks her to continue her special lesson. Anglia comes back to her senses and pleads for Timiolos to lend her just a bit of his power so that she can keep fighting. She's surprised to see her partner laughing at her request. He tells her that he has no use for her. Anglia reminds him that he can't forsake a fellow apostle because the demon lord will not allow it. Timiolos drops the bombshell that she's not an apostle. He explains that an apostle is someone who has received a portion of the demon king's power and has the ability to use it. A crest appears on their body as proof of that. He then reveals his chest to show the mark. Anglia begins to fall into despair when she realizes that she doesn't have one. Timiolos adds that her value was in her intellect and magical might, and now that that has expired, she is of no use. He loves the look on her face as her screams get louder. This causes the spell which captures despair to activate as she gets transformed and taken up to the demon lord as negative energy. Everyone watches on shocked at her fate. Timiolos casually gets back to business as he engages Beatrice. She fires some magic at him, but he casually blocks everything and counters with a devastating wombo combo that sends her crashing down. Her students call to her as they prepare to join the fight, but she shrieks at them to stay back. The teacher struggles, but gets back on her feet. 
I am pretty impressed she has a solid chin. It seems like Temiolos has the same sentiments. He expresses his gratitude that she got up again. He comments on how boring it would have been if it ended there. Beatrice has her Rock Lee moment when she removes her weighted blazer and glasses. She starts releasing a green energy wave. It turns into a tornado that covers her. The teacher fires it at Temiolos who weathers the storm which shocks everyone. The villain laughs it off and only complains about her destroying his favorite coat. With a sinister look on his face, he tells her that she will compensate for it with her life, a pretty hefty price to pay for a lab coat. He dashes towards her and overwhelms her with a number of punches and kicks as she tries to stand her ground. Her students can see that she's struggling, so they launch a combination attack at Temiolos, but he swats them anyway. He returns the favor by unleashing an area attack that takes out Class F. Beatrice can only look on devastated as her students cry in pain. The intruder gets excited to see her despair when she finally loses her pupils. She stands in front ready to protect them at the cost of her life. Timiolos wants to test her conviction, so he imbues his hand with a magic spell and raises it to end her with a downward motion. Beatrice closes her eyes and surrenders to her fate, but before the blow lands, Siichi makes it in time and stops his hand. The students get excited when they see him, he's confused as to what happened during his absence. Timiolos orders him to release his hand before quickly firing a magic attack, but to his shock, Siichi instantly dodges it while whisking his assistant to safety. He makes sure that everyone is fine and instructs Saria and Oliga to take care of them. The teacher angrily looks and hisses at Timiolos as he asks him if he's the one responsible responsible for this mayhem. The intruder gets intimidated a little and takes a step back. Siichi's eyes turn red as he rages at the sight of all the pain he has caused. Timiolos realizes that he's in trouble, so he quickly releases the full power of the seal. He fires a stupid amount of magic blast at Siichi hoping to end him, but the teacher uses flash steps as he strolls past the attacks. When he finally closes the distance, he gives him a knockout uppercut to the face that sends him flying into the demon's eye. As he screams in despair, he too is absorbed by their summons. With the enemy defeated, the barrier that trapped the students vanishes, the principal's restraints also do the same as he regains consciousness. His class and acquaintances look on amazed at what they just witnessed, their wonder is mirrored by the rest of the students as they scream and shout with happiness that this ordeal is over. As his people rush over to him, Siichi apologizes for the late arrival which caused everyone unnecessary suffering. His pupils ask where he was all that time, but he gives a vague answer to save face. Agnos is pumped that both his teachers are strong, and while he gives them high Helen smiles and hopes that she will get stronger like the both of them, Principal Barnabas quietly watches on as everyone interacts, Brud helps his arrogant older brother up after he just had some humbleness knocked into him. Theobald asks his younger brother if he will laugh at his pathetic loss, but Brud refuses, and tells him that this experience only shows that they all have much to learn. He hopes that they can all get stronger, Theobald releases himself from his younger brother's hold and walks off without saying a word. Meanwhile, in an unknown location, Destra sits at a table with Jempel and Vitor. Yudis gives respect as he greets them for assembling. He alerts the group that Anglia and Temiolos were sent to attack the academy but met their demise. The group is impressed with the strength of the enemy. Destra comments that from what she saw, she is not surprised by the outcome. Yudis informs them he summoned them so that they can make their next move. Vitor doesn't have a problem with the agenda but he wants to know why Yudis is giving them orders. The masked man quickly apologizes if it comes across that way, he even acknowledges that he could never give orders. He was only hoping to borrow their aid for the revival of the Demon King. Jimple gets up and informs everyone that he will be the first to strike, the rest don't object so he disappears to make his preparations. Things continue with the main cast still lingering around the now empty auditorium, Siichi asks who the attackers were, and Agnos tries to remember what they called themselves but he gets it completely wrong. Principal Barnabas corrects him telling everyone that they were the Great Devil Order, with their appearance he predicts that the final battle is drawing near. As he explains how everyone needs to come together and face the threat, the main cast ignores him as they are too busy talking among themselves. He tries to get their attention to no avail. Unbeknownst to them, the recently defeated Temiolos manages to manifest his spirit and fires a powerful magical attack at Siichi in an attempt to end him, but Aaron Sito spots the attack and jumps Rambo style and takes the blow with Siichi. They both fall unconscious as Temiolos disappears while laughing. The others watch on in shock and confusion at first. But things start to get more serious when Saria calls to him and gets no response. Everyone gathers around crying in disbelief that he's done, even the principal has a little teardrop in his eye. He didn't expect him to die so suddenly, as everyone mourns, 
the two spirits are transported to a floating island. Chi is joined shortly by Aaron who is happy to have finally found him, but he doesn't know who she is so he slyly asks her to identify herself. She reveals her name and energetically tells him that they have been together since middle school but CHE finds her name amusing as he compares it to the name of other random things. A voice interrupts them offering to explain their situation. He informs them that they are in the underworld, a realm inhabited by the souls of the dead. This immediately freaks them as they learn that they have died. The voice starts to berate CHE for dying so easily. This could be a problem since CHE is the protagonist so if he remains dead the story is finished. The voice pleads for him to find some way to come back to life and gives a clue by informing them that they must find and pass through the gate of the living that exists somewhere in the underworld. Aaron is determined to help bring CHE back to life, but the teacher doesn't seem as enthusiastic. To reach their goal, the two must win a series of games and the first happens to be the Sudden Cross Ultra Quiz. The voice explains that he will be asking Siichi questions about his life and in order for them to proceed he must choose either yes or no by leaping into whichever answer he thinks is right. Siichi is interested to know what happens if he gets the wrong answer and he is told that it will mean instant death, which is a bit paradoxical because he is already dead. The voice glosses over that point and tries to get them hyped to play the game. Aaron gets kidnapped while the question has been presented to Siichi he is shocked when he's asked if it's true that Aaron fell in love with him at first sight. She is brought back gagged and tied so that she can't reveal the answer to him. He asks her if she is in love with him, but the voice informs him that she cannot answer. The guy reveals that he has never had anyone fall in love with him at first sight before. He starts to get a little smug at the possibility. There is a jet ski with a Syria themed helmet. Siichi must ride it and crash into the yes or no board. As he goes around to gather momentum, he realizes that Aaron is trying to cross her legs to indicate no. Although a little disappointed, Siichi crashed into the no board. The voice informs him that he's correct. Aaron has now been ungagged and tied so she shouts over to approve of him getting it right. To explain the answer further, the voice makes them watch a video clip on some game show vibe. This flashes back to middle school, Aaron sat on the school rooftop eating her lunch alone because she didn't have any friends. She looked a lot nerdier and more reserved back then. One day, while eating she drops her chopsticks. Siichi is on hand to give her his spare chopsticks. Since neither of them fit into the school, they started eating lunch together. One day Siichi accidentally offends her by asking why she was eating alone. He explains that he asks because she's not being bullied like him. When she gives her reason, he alerts her that she should be more confident because she is nice, honest, and a good listener. He slips and then he thinks she's cute too at the end. This gets her blushing as he apologizes for saying such odd things. It looks like Chubby Siichi had mad Riz too. It is revealed that it was because of the hidden game that got her attracted to him. His Riz is definitely over 9,000. With the retelling of that moment, Siichi finally recalls her. She has changed a lot since then and it is thanks to his kind words. As a show of gratitude, she gave her life to protect him when he was in danger. The voice congratulates them for passing the first checkpoint and Siichi is shocked to hear that they are already proceeding to the final stage. Meanwhile at the Wimber Kingdom, the king summons guild master Gussel and whip expert Eris to tell them that the crown has received a letter from the demon kingdom. They are officially requesting to forge an alliance. The gravity of the situation is a bit lost when it pans out to show that Eris has tied up the king when he fell asleep she cracks her whip happy with her handiwork. During that interval, the demon lord calls her trusted advisors to ask for their aid regarding the alliance matter and gives them a chance to voice out any concerns. Urus points out his worries about Gussel. He feels like that character should not be allowed close to the demon lord given his unpredictability. The ladies agree with that statement as they look at his well-chiseled body. Loan feels like he would get along well with such an extroverted character. The rest assure the demon lord that Eris is a little bit more reasonable. Little do they know that she is worse. Back in the Wimber Kingdom, the monarch has put the finalization of the alliance in his two advisors' hands. Meanwhile, in the underworld, Siichi and Eren are at the door of the final checkpoint, the stone doors open, and they are greeted by ancestor Miku and his men. He introduces himself with a very strange pose and has a flamboyant personality to say the least. Just from his short display, Siichi believes that this stage is truly hell, the voice informs them that once they get through the labyrinth, the gate of the living lies beyond. But the ancestor is not going to make it easy for them and will defend the passage to the last. He tells Siichi plainly that he will need to protect his personal gate, 
This confuses Siichi at first. However, it becomes clear when Mika does Kakashi's 1000 years of death hand pose. That is going to be the main mode of attack during this fight and Siichi is their only target. They enter the maze and after a brief chase, Eren turns the tables when she gets both of the Miku's minions. Siichi finds it gross, but since it's the name of the game, he attacks the main man, but his fingers break because he has bonds of steel. With his fingers injured, the ancestor boastfully asks him to surrender and live in the underworld. The minions come back to attack, but Siichi counters with a flurry of pokes that takes them out. Mika rushes over to check on his men. While promising to avenge them in a dramatic speech, Eren takes the opportunity for her and Siichi to dash for the exit. Mika chases after them causing the ex-nerd to fall, she asks him to leave her behind. This gives the guardian of the gate a chance to catch up again, he uses his ultimate skill to land a direct hit on the poor guy, causing him to scream in pain. During that interim in the human world, Yudis informs Destra that her colleagues are on the move, she gets off her throne with her scythe ready to join the action. Back in the underworld, Siichi lies there unconscious as Mika talks trash, this gingers him to get up full of power, and he feels like this is the moment that he surpasses the ancestor. Mika senses his power and begins to shake in fear. Siichi enters Netero mode as his aura oozes from his body while he moves his hands so quickly that there is an afterimage. Shout out to the legendary hunter. Eren looks unhopeful that her crush will win, Mika doesn't get intimidated as they exchange a barrage of attacks that cause the ground to shake. Siichi sees his punch and slips it Mayweather style and counters with a punch of his own to the ancestors gut which knocks the wind out of his body, causing him to slump to the floor. Mika does a self-analysis and acknowledges that he lost his sense of how to fight during the battle. He tries to motivate himself back into the fight, but the underworld has had enough of him as he's stricken by lightning. This leaves the place open for the two to run past him while he gives his loser speech, they head straight towards the labyrinth exit. The voice is impressed with his performance so he decides to give them a lift to the gate of the living. Siichi just lets it known that he would have preferred if he did that from the beginning instead of putting them through the nonsense trials. But the voice lets him know that struggles are a necessary part of the journey. It notifies Siichi that it was fun interacting with him in the underworld. Just before he leaves, he hints to Siichi to check his status, the next moment he wakes up to everyone around him with worried faces. They begin to cry tears of joy that he's back alive, their reunion is interrupted when Louise stumbles and injured. She collapses, but Siichi gets to her before she hits the floor as everyone rushes over to see if she's okay. Eren lingers behind with a sinister smile on her face. The story carries on when Rand's king of Wimberg summons Louise and orders her to bring Siichi to the kingdom to witness the forging of the alliance between demons and humans. She makes haste via horseback to execute the monarch's orders. Meanwhile, before the arrival of the delegation of demons, Guildmaster Gussel and his top executives conduct an audition for a recruit using a talent show. The prospects take turns on the stage showcasing their various talents, however, they all fall short. Victor from the Devil Order infiltrates and puts a stunning display, he first passes the milk tasting test with flying colors, the other executive steps up for him to keep up with his hip trust and Victor does so to everyone's surprise. Lastly, the guild master takes his inspection and is impressed with his physique under this vintage outfit, just by touch he can see that his body is refined to its limits and even compares his biceps to the size of mountains. Victor decides to show what he's working with by posing like he's in the Olympia, this gets Gussel more pumped and immediately announces him as their new member to the cheers of the crowd. The top executives hold a congratulatory ceremony as they surround and acknowledge his achievement. Shortly after, the city bell rings to announce the arrival of the demon delegation and the start of the summit. With their new member chosen the guild master quickly concludes the selection festival to prepare. The giant gates open to the demon lord Lucia and her subordinates enter to a full royal welcome, Rans thanks them for coming and she is impressed with the grand welcome. All the while, a member of the devil order gets an update from Alio, all is going to plan at the moment. As they laugh among themselves, ominous smog sweeps over the Kaiser Empire that leaves the people in a dismal state, their army has also been mobilized as they prepare their attack. The Emperor's sword Zakia stands atop the castle overlooking the place saddened by how far they have fallen, as he walks through the place corridor he thinks about the bedridden King Alf and worries about where the nation is heading now. He feels ashamed as he wonders if there is nothing else he can do other than be a puppet in service of the country. He pauses when he notices one of the doors open, he walks in as Alio brags about how the Kaiser Empire basically belongs to the Devil Order now. They keep gathering negative energy from the royal family all the way down to the commoners, 
No one is spared. Now all they need to do is revive the great devil and dominate the world. After hearing everything, Sakia reveals himself and confronts Alio. The evil wizard scolds him for eavesdropping and calls it a bad habit. I think the old timer's inclination for evil is a little worse of a habit. The emperor's sword shuts him up, not wanting to hear a moral lesson from him. He wants to know if that's what the wizard has been planning this whole time while pretending to be an advisor to the king. Alio is just surprised that the knight is still adhering to Emperor Alf's mandate even though he has been shadow usurped. The wizard states that the world is filled with people crying and begging for salvation and that despair will feed the great devil's revival. While he has his monologue, the sky over the kingdom turns red as an eye emerges. Zakia vows that he will not allow their plans to come to fruition. He grabs his sword and attacks the wizard, but he is already ahead as it is revealed that it was only a projection of him. As his specter disappears, he tells the knight that no one can stop their plan. Zakia quickly gets on horseback and rushes to do something about the situation. As he speeds along, he recalls his conversation with the Bedridden King. The monarch informed him that in the past, a nation was suddenly attacked by monsters and everything was burned down, the king tried to fight back but he was no match for them all. He created the Kaiser Empire to prevent such things from happening again but he knows that the kingdom is currently in a sorry state. He tells Sakia that if the nation is ever faced with such a crisis, he wants him to rise and save it. If such an instance happen again, the knight will need to work with other nations to fight the threat by with him leading the country himself. Sakia plans to honor his king's wishes but unbeknownst to him, Destra has been tracking his movement. Just as he arrives at the Allied Kingdom, he is ambushed in the outskirts by the Devil Order member. The knight manages to avoid the assault, but his steed is not so lucky. She smugly stands there with her scythe asking where he's in such a hurry to go. She addresses him by name, but he doesn't have a clue who she is. Sakia warns her that if she stands in his way, he will show no mercy. She pays no attention to his threat as she alerts him that the world will be plunged into chaos. The knight captain is in shock as she disappears and reappears behind him asking for his opinion on her statement. He quickly slices at her but she evades the attack easily. After confirming her affiliation he tries to strike again but she blocks and begins to toy with him till she trips on a stone. Zakia sees the opportunity and goes for a finishing blow, but Destra activates her power for an instant and stops it with a single finger. She admits that he almost got her before firing magic that makes the knight captain's body shake. He turns around to see the effects of the spell and the tree that was hit begins to melt. After showing the sample, she begins to fire a barrage of the same spells at Zakia's armor causing it to melt off. She laughs as he falls to his knees, he wants to know what their objective is. Destra closes the distance and lets him know that she just wants to have fun as she touches his face with the spell. This causes him to scream in agony as he falls to the floor, Destra feels like it's time to finish this beatdown. However, the knight captain shows some grit and forces himself back up alerting her that the fight is not over yet. He feels like if he dies now there is no way he would be able to face Emperor Alf in the afterlife. Zakia swings at her again but she blocks with her aura which breaks his blade as he looks down in despair Destra tries to console him. He is busy thinking about how the king entrusted him with the blade that legitimizes his reign. Alf gave him the epithet of the Emperor's sword and ordered him not to bring dishonor to that title in battle. With this ringing in his ear, Sakia slams the broken blade on the floor which creates a magic seal, from it he pulls the true form of the blade and fires a wave attack that Destra casually blocks. She expresses her disappointment in his power given his position as Knight Captain before gearing up to finish him. He closes his eyes as he prepares to eat the blow but Louise appears out of nowhere and blocks the attack. She introduces herself as the Captain of the Valkyries but she shouldn't have done that because it has not been a good day for people of that rank. She makes the bold claim that whoever sheds blood on their land will receive no mercy, Destra finds her statement amusing. Zakia pleads for her to run away, and as he tries to warn her she interrupts stating that she will take on their attacker's full might. The Valkyrie dashes at her but Destra easily dodges all her attempts and counters with a single attack that sends her bouncing off a tree. She lands on the floor shaking like a leaf that just fell from a tree. She states that her master is stronger than Destra and he would defeat her in an instant, this is debatable because he's not around to save them. Zakia is still pleading for Louise to leave the area but Destra has other plans for her as she charges up a larger version of her spell. She fires it but the knight captain jumps in front and takes the attack. It destroys his armor leaving him with a severe injuries to his chest and stomach. As Louise holds him, Destra gets a vision that causes her to leave with a somber look. Zakia struggles with his last bit of energy to let Louise know the situation and entrust the future to her. She yells for him not to go to the light 
as he loses consciousness. Things shift much later when Louise reports the situation to Siichi as they travel to the Wimberg Kingdom to witness the signing of the alliance, but with what Louise has just revealed, the summit is most likely in danger too. But Saria is confident that they will be fine till their arrival because they have strong individuals around. Siichi sees that the captain of the Valkyries is worried so he assures her that they will make sure that the alliance is forged which cheers her up. Meanwhile, at the Wimberg Kingdom, the representatives from both kingdoms sit facing each other. Things are a bit tense as Urus confronts Gussel for insulting his beard earlier. The guild master asks him why he called the underwear tradition of their guild vulgar. Because of these transgressions, both of them shout that the alliance is off. This prompts the representative to fight among themselves Royal Rumble style. Demon Lord Lisha tries to calm everyone, but she's silenced with organic cake to the face. Rands also gets the same when he tries to say something too. Victor becomes the voice of reason as he gives a speech reminding them why they gathered in the first place. His points are so hard-hitting that they stop and begin to make amends. Siichi and his entourage arrive at the site and think that they have the wrong place. The king calls to him which alerts him that it is the right place. He greets him before asking Louise what happened to her. By the time she finishes explaining the situation, everyone is back in their seats in a more serious mood. The two kings agree that the matter has now grown bigger than their two nations. They cannot let the Great Devil Order and the Kaiser Empire execute their plans unopposed. The monarchs officially sign the alliance with the hope they can work together to protect the world. Siichi and Saria watch on as the representatives shake hands ready for the fight ahead. Events of what happened at the academy shortly after Siichi left for the Wimberg Kingdom are shown. The main cast says their goodbyes as his carriage pulls off. Beatrice orders everyone to get back to class as Angos wishes he could have gone with Siichi. Karen notices Aaron's sinister smile but says nothing. The two make their way through the corridors and Karen comments that she doesn't seem as lively as usual. She ignores the comments and rather asks Karen if she thinks that Siichi will be okay but Karen is confident given how strong he is. Aaron's reaction makes her feel uneasy, so she heads to class. When alone, it is revealed that it's not the real Aaron, but rather Jempel the doppelganger. He's one of the Great Devil Order's top four members. As he walks alone through the corridors, we get his villain origin story. It is disclosed that he grew up as an upper-class noble who didn't lack anything. However, his heart never felt fulfilled, people only surrounded themselves with him because of his status as noble. Even his parents didn't show him any love and only viewed him as a tool to inherit and continue their lineage. No one paid attention to his true face as he fell into despair. The flashback comes to an end when Agnos calls to who he thinks is Aaron. They are a little confused that she's in the men's bathroom. Gampel recognizes them as Siichi's students and reveals that she is there to crush them and make their teacher feel despair. Before they can process what is going on, she attacks Agnos with a powerful punch that sends him back. To further confuse them, he uses his doppelganger powers to change into Saria and lands a hit on the terrifying Pompadour of Hell. The others recognize it as transformation magic and are shocked that she can use Cyrus' powers still thinking that it's Eren. Jimple informs them that he can also copy the powers of whoever he changes into. He then knocks them all out with a devastating punch. Agnos lands in the urinal with the other two lying on the bacteria-infested floor. He finally reveals his true form to them confirming that he is not Aaron and piles them up intending to end them in front of Siichi. In the meanwhile, he aims to send the rest to the afterlife and decides to start with Lillian who sits at one of the school's gardens ready to eat her favorite steamed buns. He changes back to Aaron and sneaks up a knife in hand ready to end her, but she senses the attack and knocks the blade out of his hands thinking that he's coming for the food. But when Lillian realizes that it's who she thinks is Aaron, she calms down and even offers half of her food. As they eat, she alerts Aaron that they consider her a friend because he saved Siichi in the past. Jempel thinks that she is taking to him so he starts to get sentimental because in his past he never had any friends. The continued niceness from Lillian makes him unable to hurt her so he runs away. Later on, the rain begins to pour and he catches Oliga alone outside so he changes into Lillian to get closer, looking to take her life. He gets into character and calls to her as she closes the distance. Oliga reaches for something and Jempel gets on guard thinking that it's a weapon but to his surprise, it's an umbrella. Oliga gives it to her because she's taller, he thinks back to when he was attacked by some noble bullies who took his umbrella. When he asks why the kind gesture, Oliga explains while thinking it's the real Lillian that she always shares her food and also because they are buddies. Hearing this removes his killing intent, 
so he returns the umbrella and runs off again leaving Olga a bit confused. Jimpel finds himself in the corridors still as Lillian but he comes across Artoria staring aimlessly out the window. The imposter is determined to take out at least one of them, so he turns to Siichi who happens to be the man Artoria loves the most. All the while, the real Siichi is on his way back from the signing of the alliance, but they make a stop at a mountain village to restock. Saria makes her way out of the shop after buying some drinks and comes across Destra who is randomly sitting there looking sad. Saria notices her mental state and interrupts wanting to know what the matter is. Destra looks up and is shocked by how much she looks like someone from her past. She composes herself and answers that she was just reminiscing, but all is well. She comments on what a fine young lady Saria is, but a call from Siachi catches her attention. When Saria addresses him by name it shocks Destra, the guy looks over and feels like he has seen her before. Destra is happy to have found him and springs up to confirm that he is indeed the guy. Siachi is a bit surprised that she knows him, but she explains that it is because he is famous, there are rumors that he is so strong that the king of Wimberg relies on him. Destra carries on the hype stating that he's a real hero. Siichi wants to know why she's by herself. She tells him that she's on a journey looking for fun things to do. She then asks him if he's happy at the moment which confuses him a little but Saria answers for him. Destra musters that she's jealous before leaving. She promises them their paths will cross again. Back at the school, Jimple begins to make his move as he approaches Artosha calling to her. She is surprised to see who she thinks is Siichi and wonders why he's back so early given the important mission he went on. The imposter answers that he came back because he wanted to see her alone. He continues with the city boy energy alerting her that she's the only one he has eyes for at the moment. With an overjoyed look, Artosha wants to know where all of this is coming from as he pleads to hug her. This makes her blush as he closes the distance he lands the hug but just as he's about to knife her, she jumps out of the way and pushes him because she feels like he's behaving strangely, she rushes over to apologize as Jempel wonders if this is what Siichi goes through all the time with her. Artosha has a moment of thanking him for accepting her even though everyone called her the calamity, so she too wants to accept everything about him. This strikes a painful nerve with Jempel as he remembers that no one paid attention to his feelings and true face in his younger days, so to experience some level of acceptance even if it's indirect makes him feel good. He wants to know why Artosha talks the way she does. The Calamity grabs him by his robe and confesses that she loves him. She gives the imposter the go-ahead to hug her. This shocks Jimple as he wonders if Siichi is such a good guy. His delayed response gets Artosha angry, so she lands a sweet punch that sends him flying. He stays as Siichi for a while and as he interacts with the others, he wonders why they all adore him so much. So he decides to spend some time as Siichi to find out. All the while, Karen watches him and worries at what she's seeing. The imposter has settled in so well that he goes on a high-level picnic with Artosha and a few others. They comment on how nice it is to eat outdoors every once in a while, and they all laugh as the imposter corrects a silly mistake Lillian made. The bliss is ruined when Jempel realizes that he's enjoying this school life too much and has deviated from the mission. Artosha reminds the principal that he wanted to discuss something with them all, so he tells them that it's about the Great Devil Order. Oliga remembers him saying that the day of the final battle was close, just as Barnabas is about to discuss his point, they are interrupted by the appearance of a giant orc. The imposter smirks and suggests that the monster was probably awakened by the Great Devil's pulse. The principal finds that comment odd because Siichi shouldn't know that. The orc attacks them, but they swiftly dodge. Barnabas prepares to fire a spell just as the monster begins to land a downward attack on the girls, but the imposter jumps in the way and uses Siichi's inner power to intimidate it. Sensing his power, it pauses as it sweats in fear before quickly retreating. The girls praise him for his display of power and reliability, and the principal interrupts saying that the orc explains the evil presence he has been sensing at the academy lately, it is just that he wasn't able to locate it. Karen chimes in and comments that the imposter managed to deceive everybody's eyes, but her nose can't be deceived. She drops the bombshell that the man standing before them is not Siichi. This surprises them a little, Artosha wants to know if Karen has any proof, the real Aaron steps out from behind a tree as Karen the Nose Detective explains that anyone that interacted with her over the last couple of days has been dealing with a fake. She rescued the real one from the Academy's chicken coop. Karen commends the intruder's ability to copy his target's appearance and abilities, but what he can never copy is their natural body fragrant. With the cat out of the bag, Gample reveals himself to everyone and his high position in the Great Devil Order. He confesses his plan to capture and
and eliminate them all in front of Siichi as that is the best strategy for plunging him into despair. This was until he became his enemy and realized something, Gample himself lived his entire life without being loved by anyone. So he never cared if anyone else died, but after experiencing the love through impersonating Siichi, he understands how losing precious people can be a sad thing. That is why he couldn't help but save them all from the orc. They are all surprised by his change of heart, Gample wants to find someone that can accept him just like the way they all have accepted Siichi. He casually says his goodbyes as he abandons his current mission for his new one, Karen gives him hope stating that she can smell the potential for him to be loved, this makes him happy. Artosha is a little worried that they are letting him go like that. Barnabas explains that with Gample's power, he could have easily killed them all but he didn't, and because of that gesture, he wants to believe that Gample can rewrite his mistakes. That evening on a hill overlooking the academy, Gample tells a hooded member of the order that he quits. Before he can finish giving his reason, the person ends him and disappears as he lies face down on the floor. Meanwhile, the real CHE makes his way back to the academy, but he still tries to shake off the uneasy feeling that he's seen Destra somewhere before. The story continues when Guildmaster Gussel and his top executives get together at the local bar to let loose before the battle with the Great Devil Order. As they make a toast, Victor sits away with a sinister look and smiles excited to start his operation after infiltrating the upper echelon of the guild. As the others have their fun, he fights the urge to wreak havoc in people around him to collect despair for the Great Devil's resurrection. Later that night, Pacifier Man looks out one of the castle windows admiring the night sky, he turns around and has a look of surprise on his face before he falls moments later and begins to bleed. The following morning, Victor stylishly takes pictures of the crime scene as Pacifier Man lays there, baby bottle in hand surrounded by other empty bottles with his pants zipper down. Gussel who has taken the role of a detective labels him dead just from observation, everyone gasps in shock but Eris decides to check and confirms that he has a pulse. Gussel glosses over her findings as he angrily curses the one that did this to his comrade. Eris shouts that he's still alive but speculates that the Great Devil Order is staging their attack. Before she can finish her statement, Victor and the guild master enter detective mode promising to find the culprit behind the crime, they both swear on their muscles. They begin their investigation and Gussel is impressed with Victor's outfit, just from looking at the scene, Victor concludes that the Great Devil Order is most likely not the culprit. Eris wants to know what makes him so certain, but she doesn't get an answer because Gussel tells the team that they should go over the evidence. He calls Victor over to inspect the milk that was near Pacifier Man. After a few sips he notes that his estimated time of death was between that morning and the previous night. The Guild Master is impressed by his analysis but Eris feels like this doesn't tell them anything because they already know that information. They notice that his fly is down and unzipped so they jump to another conclusion that makes the lady confused. The two continue their investigation when Gussel notices the victim holding some tea in a bottle. He picks it up but drops it on the floor which breaks it. This annoys Eris because he's tampering with the evidence so she lashes him with her whip but the guy seems to be enjoying it more than you can imagine. They next move to the interrogation phase where they question the suspects but the guild master is a little heavy-handed and direct with his execution. The trench coat man is very offended that they would even suspect him since he's an ally. Victor explains that it is the protocol to suspect those close to the victim first, so they plead for his forgiveness. To show that he's innocent, he shows off his white brief which are so bright that Victor and Gussel believe that only someone pure of heart can maintain their briefs to such a level. So they move to their next suspect, named Destroyer, he too denies doing it. Victor brings out a substance that will be applied to his iron ball to see if it was used as a murder weapon. If there is blood on it, it should glow blue. The guild master spills it on his blue pants and starts to panic thinking that he's the culprit, but Victor informs him that he's already wearing blue pants which calms him down. With the assailant not found after more questioning, they hold a funeral for the pacifier man that evening on a cliff. Eris gets frustrated because she has already told them that he's not dead. Their attention is drawn when the forcibly labeled deceased man pops out of the ground and grabs the guild master by the legs. He starts to panic thinking that he's turned into a zombie. But the pacifier man casually stands up and stretches like he just got up from a long nap. Gussel is happy to see that he's alive, but Victor is a bit mystified. 
Pacifier Man is also confused by everyone's reaction as Eris asks him to explain what happened to him the previous night. After he admired the night sky, nature called so he wanted to relieve himself, but he slipped on one of his bottles and fell knocking himself unconscious as his drink spilled over his head giving the impression that he was bleeding. Everyone laughs as he finishes his explanation, but Eris is not amused by this whole situation, the guildmaster officially closes the case. After a long day of investigation, Gussel invites everyone to the local bathhouse together, he then turns to Victor to thank him for helping resolve the issue quickly. They seal things with a bro handshake, all the while Eris is analyzing the situation thinking how he knew that it wasn't the work of the Great Devil Order. Victor notices her suspiciously looking at him and smirks when she looks away. Meanwhile at the academy, Siichi addresses his class informing them of the recent alliance between the Demon Lord Army and the Wimberg Kingdom and how they plan to collaborate to fight against the Great Devil Order. He wants them to be able to protect themselves before the fighting starts and is entrusting the academy to them to defend. Back at the kingdom, Eris makes her way home through a dark alley, how However, a shadowy figure lurks in the darkness watching her. She feels a presence behind her and turns to find Victor standing there. She is surprised because he was supposed to meet the others at the bath. He cuts the small talk and reveals his true identity as one of the top four of the Great Devil Order. The guy hopes that her demise will bring him joy. After a brief exchange he quickly subdues her with a punch to the gut. Victor is disappointed that she put up such a weak defense. As he throws the finishing blow, Gussel appears and catches the punch. He shakes in anger wanting to know what is going on, the infiltrator is impressed with the guildmaster's intuition given the idiotic vibe he normally gives. Gussel addresses Victor as his friend which makes him laugh because he never considered him one. As he continues to mock him, the guildmaster connects with a very powerful punch that sends him flying through all the city walls and into the outskirts. He makes sure that Eris is fine before jetting off to face his opponent, Victor waits for him at his landing location. The guild master drops down with his eyes glowing red, he tells Victor that he will fight him at full strength causing him to gasp. Before he can react, Gussel quickly closes the distance and punches him square in the face, Victor takes it and immediately retaliates with his punch. This turns it into a manly exchange of blows with no defense, Victor gets excited as it's revealed that he has lived an unfulfilled life because he possesses such tremendous power. Every opponent he faced he could never use his full power but he's in ecstasy at the moment because he has finally found someone. Victor informs Gussel that he's picking up the pace before landing two punches that sends the guildmaster flying. He recovers quickly and cracks his joint stating that he knows that this is not Victor's full strength. Gussel comments that he should be feeling that they are communicating through their muscles and dubs it the ultimate exaltation. Victor tries to understand the feeling he's experiencing as the guildmaster instructs him to set himself free. The infiltrator gets serious as he thanks him for allowing him to wield his true ability. He begins to release a sinister power that causes him to get more muscular. He reveals that in that state he can return all attacks twofold, Gussel is not intimidated and casually walks towards him as he acknowledges his power. Victor states that he doesn't care about the Great Devil Order. They face each other and declare that at that moment, all they are concerned about is beating each other thoroughly with their full powers. Gussel goes in for the first punch which Victor tanks and returns it as a powerful strike, but the guild leader stands his ground. They exchange blows again, but the intensity is a lot more pronounced, Victor is loving every moment and knocks the guild leader into the cliff, it looks like he lands in the same spot, I think the animators don't want the extra work. As the smoke clears the infiltrator starts to trash talk but Gussel gets up with a smile stating that he's not done yet because his muscles are telling him to have fun. They charge at one another again simultaneously punching each other. The guild master falls to his knees as he alerts Victor that he's just getting started. He is surprised to see him getting up because he knows that Gussel is well past his limit. With tears streaming down his eyes, the guild master states how sad Victor's muscles are. Although he has honed his muscles to the highest level, he only pursued strength. Gussel taps his chest, but Victor tries to move it but he's not able to move his own body as he loses control. The guild master reveals that the inflator's muscles are crying, he looks over to Gussel and sees him standing strong as the presence grows and apparitions of his comrades appear behind him. Victor gets spooked out seeing them, as the guild master charges up a punch filled with grief, the infiltrator gasps as Gussel intentionally misses the punch. 
A large section of the landscape is taken out before he collapses on his opponent still calling him a friend. Victor is the loser which is a feeling he's experiencing for the first time, but oddly enough he doesn't feel any negative emotions. Victor gently places Gussel's unconscious body against the cliff and limps off like a wounded puppy, he is stopped along the way when Judy suddenly appears and comments on how rare it is to see him so beaten up. But he is sure that he didn't lose, and Victor disproves his expectations. The infiltrator has accepted it, but he never thought the day would come when he would find someone stronger than him. However, he feels so alive for the first time in his life and supposes that the taste of defeat is also delectable. Judy's is glad to see that he's made such great personal development and knows that he was just a big fish in a small pond. Victor is sure that next time he will win after some training, Judy's doesn't think there will be a next time as he ends him with a quick attack for denouncing the Great Devil Order during his fight. The masked guy reveals that his power allows him to teleport across any space, dimension, or time. Meanwhile, in an unknown location, an eye cracks as dark energy flows out, Destra gets off her throne ready to make her final move. During that interim, Siachi goes to the training hall and tries to use his magic but he's not able to, Principal Barnabas watches on with a concerned look on his face. Destra has a flashback that evokes emotion, his anger causes him to destroy a field of flowers. Meanwhile, at the academy, Barnabas gathers everyone to reveal that he invited Siachi to teach at the school because he anticipated the battles with the Great Devil Order. Beatrice gives more context by discussing their world's creation legend, one god decided to revolt against the other during the creation. This caused a devastating conflict that left much of the lands burnt, however, the troublemaker was defeated and sealed away within the world. That god's hatred for the others was so great that he cursed the world, the negative emotion took form as the fruits of evolution. Barnabas takes over revealing that that god is the great devil and those who eat the maximum fruits of evolution become fodder for him. Siichi has eaten the upper limit of the fruits, however, the holy mage assures him that it's his job to protect the teacher so he shouldn't worry. This puts his mind at ease a little, but the old guy moves to his next confession, he drops the bombshell that Destra was a pupil at the school, and it turns out we got this whole thing wrong all along as we have come to know that Destra the mofo is actually a male. He and his assistant Labura picked him up from a war-torn area, the kid lost his parents and expressed his disdain for the gods. This worried the mage, so they enrolled him into the school, where he adjusted to his new life and grew fond of Labura even giving her a flower hairpin which she loved. That bliss was quickly shattered when some monsters attacked the academy and Destra witness one of them incinerate his favorite teacher. The despair became unbearable, which was sensed by the great devil who tempted him and made Destra one of his priests. The guy blamed Barnabas for his misfortune and promised to destroy everything before disappearing. Their meeting that has now moved outside is interrupted by Destra, he defeats his old teacher before asking Judy's to teleport him and Siichi to a different dimension. It is revealed that Saria was also brought for a special purpose, Destra begins to attack Siichi as they exchange blows despite some of Siichi's powers being blocked. This allows Destra to get the advantage as he lands a crippling blow, when he prepares to finish him off, Saria intervenes and attacks the demonic priest. She's unable to keep up as Destra lands a fatal blow, Siichi rushes over to his wife and has his final moments with her. This sends him into a deep despair which was why she was brought by Destra, the dark power of the fruit takes over his body as he will be used to revive the devil. He enters an area where his memories play, Destra points out his past and tries to push him over the edge so that Siichi can be just like him. However, Siichi remembers all the love he has also been given along his journey, this ends up overpowering the darkness. Destra watches shocked as the fruit turns blue as Siichi achieves another transformation into a shoujo looking character. This releases a power that heals and revives most of the characters that were deceased or on death's door. He then overpowers Destra with love that moves the villain a little, but he decides to end things to meet Libera which effectively turns him into a fruit of evolution. With the battle over, the couple return to the academy and walk into everyone waiting for them, after they debrief, they head for a picnic. All the while, everyone else around the kingdom is also getting on with their lives, although, danger still lurks as someone infected with the fruit sits on a throne looking to make his next move. Siichi and Saria make their way to a meadow where they express their love for each other and look forward to the future, which brings the season to an end.